Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not a professor. I think uh, you said that I'm a professor in economics. I'm a professor in planning, but I have a background in economics. So I combine uh, both uh, fields. Uh, thank you, you're still here. You must be very tired after all those discussions and, and debate. Uh, I, although I didn't understand everything, but uh, I, I learned a lot about development issues in, in Sao Paulo and I think it's, it's very interesting and it very much links to my own research. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, from a very, uh, to, to talk about land management strategies for urban redevelopment, urban transformation projects from a very, I must say, very European pers perspective. But again, I think there are many links with uh, with transformation projects and strategies uh, here in Brazil, uh, and also a bit from a from a theoretical perspective, uh, trying to give a sort of a theoretical overview of uh, uh, land management strategies, value capturing, um, and, uh, and and so on. So that might be a bit boring. I, I don't have pictures of very nice fancy projects in the Netherlands. It's all boring slides, but. You have to do it with that. <laughs> uh, it's well. It's about choosing uh, choosing the right land management strategy for urban redevelopment projects. And it's also uh, apart from the European perspective, apart from the theoretical perspective, it's also sort of a, a pragmatic, instrumentalist perspective. I'm, I'm looking at uh, at instruments for uh, this kind of projects. Um, and uh, well, asking myself the question, uh, which instrument can be used uh, at, at what, what for which kind of projects? Um, it's, uh, it's based on, on a European research project I was involved in. We uh, will publish a book uh, next, next month. Um, that European research project was uh, about land management strategies for urban dynamics in European countries. Uh, about 20 different European countries participated in the project uh, and we're going to publish that book uh, with uh, information uh, about land management strategies in all those countries. But my talk is also uh, based on uh, research that I, that I did uh, last year in the United States, uh, together with an uh, American colleague, Professor Harvey Jacobs, uh, that research, and there we uh, looked at, uh, we compared Dutch, Dutch land management strategies and, and American land management strategies. Uh, and there's a paper that will be published in, in Town Planning Review, probably uh, next year, I hope next year, uh, but if you're interested, I can, I can send you copies uh, of that paper. I'll give the information later on. Uh, <clears throat> so, when we talk about planning, then of course there's always a relation with, uh, a very close relation with uh, the land market uh, and with land policy. The, I always tell my students that uh, land policy, land management strategies always serve a greater goal, namely to uh, implement land use plans. It's, it's meant to implement planning. Uh, the second uh, issue is that uh, in Europe, but the same goes for, uh, for this city, uh, we have mature cities and mature cities increasingly uh, have to deal with, with urban renewal, urban redevelopment, uh, which is completely different from greenfield development, of course. Uh, and successful implementation of those projects, I think, depend, uh, depends on the, on the scope of the project, which has been discussed here as well in the, in the afternoon. Uh, good governance, uh, planning, and, and land policy. Four, still introduction, four different observations. Uh, first, Uh, urban development all over the world increasingly takes place uh, in existing urban areas. It might be infills, it might be urban redevelopment, it might be brownfields. Uh, all those projects, and, and again compared to 
to greenfield developments, uh, those projects are usually complex by nature, I would say. Uh, in, and that's the European perspective, uh, I think very different from the, the current situation in Brazil, uh, but there's a financial and economic crisis going on, uh, which has caused that many projects have come to a standstill. Uh, the, the planning for decline issue that I mentioned this, uh, this, this morning. Uh, for, uh, for, for the Netherlands, uh, and I'll explain that a bit uh, with, with, with this figure. Uh, the enormous increase of development gains have not solved the problem. What I mean with development gains is uh, the, uh, the increment of land value uh, that, uh, in, that, that stems from, uh, from changes in land use. If you change the land use, then there will be an increase uh, in, in land value, uh, that land, that increase in land value can be used to uh, to cover the costs of developing that land, and then there's something left over, which is the development gain, the, the, the purple uh, arrow uh, in between. Well, what we see in the Netherlands, which is just an example, is that in the last 20 years, uh, the development gain increased enormously for the simple reason that property prices increased a lot and of course and, and because property prices increased land values increased as well. Uh, the, in a way there's always a, a, a struggle uh, between the diff different uh, agents uh, for that development gain. Part of that development gain will go to the original landowner. Uh, if he's smart and he's, he, he's able to negotiate, then he will, uh, he will capture part of that development gain. Then part of the development gain uh, will go to the, to the developer, uh, depending again on the negotiations between uh, landowners and the developer. And then part of that development gain uh, might go to, uh, to, to the government, or to social goals, uh, to implement infrastructure, public works, to implement affordable housing, etc. So there's the, the amount of money that is available for all those social goals uh, depends on how much the other agents uh, in, in land development processes will gain. And that, if we compare that in the international context, then it, it depends on, uh, on, on some, sometimes historical situations, how uh, all those different agents deal with those projects. Uh, and of course, it uh, also depends on, on legislation and instruments, instruments that can be used by local governments to capture part of that value. Uh, but why is it so difficult to implement urban development projects? First, we usually have a high development costs. Uh, Brownfields means, often means cost of, of clean, contaminated land, uh, demolishment costs, uh, and uh, new infrastructure and public transport investments that are necessary to redevelop the location. Then we have landowner constraints. Uh, in, in those, and, and again, if we, if we take a very uh, uh, black and white comparison between greenfield and brownfield development, then greenfield development uh, might mean that there are three or four owners uh, who, uh, three or four owners uh, that has to be sold out, bought out uh, in uh, uh, redevelopment transformation projects, it might be hundreds of owners who have to be bought out, which makes the project very uh, complex. Uh, and it also uh, implies that because you have to negotiate uh, if the developer, uh, and that can be a public developer, as I will explain later, or a private developer, has to negotiate with all the different owners, uh, which might increase uh, the, the hope values in, uh, in that area. Owners might think, and I think that, that was something that came up in, in one of the presentations as well, we better wait for development uh, because in one or two or three years' time we will, we will get a better price for our property. Uh, then 
there's an uncertain demand, which is especially developed for uh, many European cities uh, and, and many and certainly many American cities. Will uh, people are, will, are people willing to change their suburban lives for an urban life? And do they want to live in in, uh, in apartments in urban neighborhoods, uh, which is questioned a lot in the Netherlands? Uh, and uh, there are ineffective policy tools. Uh, we have, uh, and of course, and, and there are also there are always limits to expropriation powers. That there should be, uh, but municipalities sometimes have to make use of expropriation powers to acquire the land. And the, uh, in in an international context, uh, there are many differences in in those in those limits to expropriation. In in a way, in the Netherlands, it's quite easy. Uh, if there's a new land use plan, you can expropriate the owners uh, because there's a new land use plan, and and the, the current use is not uh, is not the, the the expected use. In American cities, that's impossible. You can all you can only expropriate uh, for blighted properties if it's really desolate areas uh, and deteriorated properties then you might expropriate, otherwise it's not possible. I don't know how it's here, but, but that's many differences in, in an international context. Well then, a, a, a logical question... Uh, that one is mine, I think. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, the question to ask, of course, is how to improve the feasibility of those projects. Which is being discussed all day. I think. Uh, well, we can wait for better times, which is currently going on in, in many European cities. Uh, we can change the scope of the project, uh, increase densities, um, um, try to make use of uh, well, go away from ownership constraints and, and try to find ownership opportunities. Change the, the, the scope of the plan. Uh, to only those plots uh, for which the owners are willing to, to cooperate, for instance. Uh, make better use of existing infrastructure in, instead of uh, having to invest in new infrastructure. Uh, and, and then other, uh, perhaps less popular uh, interventions are considered as well, like uh, the reduction of affordable housing in your plan, which will increase uh, probably the financial fe feasibility of it. Uh, third, we might look at, at good governance. Uh, and then I'm talking about uh, the, the, the master plan strategies. Uh, I'm, thinking, I'm talking about smart growth policies, which usually include uh, the uh, restrictions to uh, urban containment. Uh, and if, we, if we're able to, to restrict, to limit urban containment, then, uh, so, sorry, if we were able to, uh, to limit urban expansions, uh, then there will be more demand for uh, new properties in, in urban transformation projects. So there's all kind of governance uh, uh, strategies. And finally, uh, effective land policy, effective land policy tools uh, might, might help as well. Now the remaining part of my presentation will be only effect about uh, land policy. But keep in mind that there's, there's, there's more ways to deal with it. If you look at land policy, I think there are uh, five uh, main objectives that, uh, for, for land policy, for land management, uh, which I think uh, are valid for, for every city all over the world. Uh, first objective is uh, that with land policy we want to make land available for, uh, for development, for redevelopment. The second objective is that we want to use land policy uh, to recover the cost of public works, public works that are needed for the, uh, for the development, like infrastructure. Uh, the third objective, which is related to cost recovery, but it's something different, uh, is about capturing the unearned, unearned increment in land value, uh, which relates to that uh, development gain issue. The, the political issue uh, is always 
to who belongs the un unearned increment uh, land value. If you change uh, the, the, the land use in a certain area, then there will be an increment in land value, as I explained before. And to who belongs that increment of land value? Does it belong to the present owners, or does it belong to the, to the government? It's, it's, it's really a political issue, which is, uh, has been discussed, for instance, in, in the UK uh, 50 years ago. Um, it was a big issue in uh, the Netherlands 30 years ago. There was even an, uh, a cabinet who had to resign because they couldn't agree on this issue. So it, it has been a uh, political debate in, in, in many countries. Um, usually, I must say, and I think all over the world, in most countries, uh, the unheard increment in land value goes to the present owners. Uh, and sometimes, uh, government uh, have, have taxes, have a tax system to uh, capture part of that. Uh, then, land policy is about political and spatial ambitions. Uh, then we talk about social housing or affordable housing. Uh, we talk about sustainable development. Um, and we, we talk about uh, good quality plans. Uh, you want to use your, your land policy instruments to uh, uh, achieve this kind of ambitions. Uh, and finally, uh, it's a bit of an economic uh, objective, is that land policy should help to increase land market, land market transparency. Uh, for instance, by, uh, with, with the land register, which, which without the land register, the land market wouldn't function. Uh, it's, it's, it's a problem, for instance, in, uh, it has been a problem in many uh, communist countries in the eastern part of Europe, uh, that there was not a, and, and also in many, many uh, African countries, uh, when there's not a land register that tells you who owns the land, then the land and property market doesn't function. Well, then, and I'm not going to, to discuss them all in, in detail, but related to, to those uh, objectives, uh, there are a lot of land management tools available to uh, municipalities. Um, it's expropriation, it's preemption rights, it's inclusionary zoning regulation to, uh, uh, to stimulate social housing. Uh, it's land banking, it's permanent land development. Um, when we talk about cost recovery, then uh, that can be, can be taxes, but it can also be developer contributions uh, for this cost recovery, cost recovery negotiated between a municipality and a private developer. Uh, and it can be different uh, uh, land readjustment models like urban land readjustment and, and public land development, which I come to uh, a bit later. Value capturing, I talked about it, uh, local taxes, uh, impact fees are sometimes used in, in some countries. Um, and, and I also talked about the land register uh, and legislation uh, for urban land readjustment. Uh, then, I, when we talk about different land management strategies, I distinguish three different, three different main strategies for uh, land policies or land management strategies. First, I would call uh, public-private initiatives, um, which includes uh, conditional development improv improvals, uh, which includes uh, master planning. Uh, I, I don't have a good word for it, but master planning combined with, with pointing out development opportunities. So it, it means the municipality uh, uh, establish, establishes a, a master plan and points out different opportunities for development uh, within this master plan and then leaves it to the private sector uh, to come up with, with ideas that fit within the master plan. Uh, and then uh, concessions, uh, like uh, we've discussed today, uh, are another example of public private issues. Then we have what I uh, would call ownership based developments. So they, uh, they start, those 
these kind of strategies uh, are meant to um, uh, to have the uh, to stimulate the owners, the present owners in a in a certain location uh, to start redevelopments. Urban, and that's what I call urban land adjustment. I, I will come to that uh, later again. Uh, it's, it's being discussed in the Netherlands because this, this kind of model we, we, we don't have in the Netherlands, uh, while many other European countries like Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Switzerland, uh, Norway, uh, and uh, Japan as well, um, they do have the system. And it's, it's being discussed if they should have a system like that. And then the, the third land management strategy, uh, which is typically Dutch, it's used in other countries as well, but, but it's, it's the main, the common model in the Netherlands, uh, has been the common model in, in Dutch cities for a long time, uh, which is public land development. Uh, well, this is this, this comes out of a book that uh, that I was talking about, uh, in which related to those three different main strategies, uh, we have identified a lot of different examples of, of country specific, country specific applications of those models. Uh, this is just for your information. I'm not going to uh, to talk about all of them. Then, if uh, and this is this is to explain public land development, the, the common model in the Netherlands. This is what is most common in many other countries. Uh, is uh, a private developer who acquires the land uh, from a landowner uh, or many landowners uh, and will be responsible for uh, land and property uh, development. Uh, and develops, uh, so makes land available and, uh, and, and will develop the property. So it's a one hand, in, in the hand of one private developer or a consortium of different developers. If we look at public land development in the Netherlands, then the system is different. Then what happens is that the municipality acquires the land from the original landowner, let's say if it's a greenfoot development, uh, they acquire the land from, um, uh, from, from farmers. Uh, they make that land available, they service the land, uh, drainage uh, systems, uh, etc. They reparcel or readjust uh, the land into new building plots and they sell those building plots to, uh, to property developers or to end users. And property developers are only responsible for property development. So they're not responsible for uh, the land. Well, to, again, to explain this, uh, uh, the municipality buys all the land uh, that should be developed for uh, either a greenfield or a transformation project. There's no monopoly powers for municipality, although for a long time in the Netherlands, it was only municipalities who were interested in buying land, and all private developers thought, well, it's okay, it's a good system, because uh, we don't earn any money with, with land development, we only earn money with property development, uh, and we get good quality locations from the municipality, uh, so, and they take all the risk, which is important as well, uh, for that land development, uh, so let them do it. Uh, but, in fact, and that's what happened in the past uh, 15 years, uh, no monopoly power, so others can uh, acquire land as well, and they, they started to do this. Uh, then the land will be serviced, uh, we just into parcels, uh, into, into building plots, uh, and what is important is that when the municipality uh, sells the building plots, then and they sell the building plots uh, against full market value, uh, so it means that uh, a substantial part of those development gains um, may go to the municipality. And the municipality uses that, uh, that part of the development gains that they receive 
use that to, to cover all the cost of public works. And they were even able to, to make money out of it, to make a profit. And they used those profits uh, for, uh, for other developments within the city that, that are less profitable. Uh, and that system works very well for a very, very long time. However, it's, uh, as, I, as I said, it's, it's risky business for municipalities because it, it only works, uh, they have to invest in, uh, in, in buying land, agricultural land or uh, brownfield land. They have to invest in servicing the land uh, and then they must hope that somebody want to sell, uh, want to buy the building plots. If not, then they have a problem. But this is something that happened uh, the past two or three years in this economic crisis. Private developers are not willing to buy uh, uh, building plots anymore, so munis municipalities are, are losing hundreds of millions of euros on their original investments, which is becoming a huge problem for uh, a lot of the largest cities in, in the Netherlands. Moreover, it worked quite well for greenfield developments, but it's, it's even more risky for uh, urban redevelopment projects. Uh, the, uh, the first thing is that they, uh, it's, they have to acquire, if it's, let's, let's say it's an urban redevelopment project. Uh, sometimes uh, properties within that project are still in use, have, still have a current use, a, a substantial current use value. They have to pay for that. It can be a manufacturing in a uh, company uh, that they have to move to another location, which costs them a lot of money. Uh, some of those properties within that urban redevelopment project are, are not included in financial accounting. If it's, it only works when all properties in that area will be demolished and there will be new developments. If some of those properties uh, remain in that area uh, and perhaps are, will be renovated, uh, then it doesn't work, then the municipality doesn't get any money from, uh, from, from that property owner. Uh, then it, takes, it, it may take a very long time to acquire all properties, if you're talking about two or three hundred different owners. Uh, the huge financial risks for the municipality, as I explained. Uh, they do have good legal power for expropriation, but still there are many complications, and well, it goes too far to explain that, but it's, it's complicated. Um, they also they do have legal powers for, for cost recovery. So for all landowners uh, or the developers that do not participate in the development and think, well, uh, because the municipality, it, it's, it's possible that they own, let's say, 80% of the, of the development, but not, not everything, then they can still uh, require from the other private developers in the area to contribute to costs that we have a new legislation for that implemented only three years ago. Uh, but it doesn't work for value capital. So it, and the, the increased value in the area might be much higher than uh, the, the, the costs that, that can be, that, that should be recovered. So a part of the development gain uh, remains then with the developer. Uh, and it's not very transparent because the municipality has to act as a market player and negotiates with all the different owners in that area uh, and, and doesn't want any transparency because they, that's not good for their negotiations. Well, this is just an example of what, what happened uh, in, in the last uh, two or three years uh, is that Municipalities always made a lot of money out of uh, out of those uh, out of this public land development, but now they're losing money. And it's expected that uh, in 2009 it was only 400 million in total, uh, and it, it's expected that this year, next year, uh, that it will be billions of euros. Um, so public land development might work in some situations, but certainly not in all situations. That's, that's, 
the, the debate going on in the Netherlands because public land development was always used uh, and now cities are looking for other, uh, for other instruments. Uh, I think for other countries uh, it might be interesting to look at, at the possibilities of public land development but only in, in certain situations um, and, and for certain locations depending on different, different issues that I will, will, will come to later in my presentation. Um, so another opportunity, another strategy uh, might be uh, this, this master planning which I think is, is a bit similar to strategies that are used in, in, in this city. Uh, and it's also many American cities make use of this, this kind of strategy. So what they do is they implement a master plan for a certain area and within that area they point out uh, different places, different blocks that, uh, are, that should be redeveloped. That the, the municipality wants those blocks to be redeveloped. Uh, and then they invite private developers to come up with, with, with ideas and plans for those different blocks, uh, negotiate, uh, they will ne negotiate with the private developer to uh, contribute to the costs of the, the master plan and then block by block uh, can, be, can be developed. If there might be a problem in this kind of de development and that situation in American cities, there are many problems with this kind of projects because within this master plan the city also would like to have affordable housing, for instance, um, and which is not profitable. So private developer, uh, who, there will be a private developer who negotiates with the municipality that, okay, uh, I might be willing to uh, include affordable housing uh, in my plan, uh, but then uh, you have to, municipality, you have to contribute to my cost because it's, it's not profitable. The uh, very simplistic way of looking at this, if there's no money in, in development, then you might look uh, at the owners, at the future owners in that area, and try to get the money from the future owners. Tax increment financing is an instrument that is, uh, that is used by I think the most commonly, commonly used instrument by, uh, by American cities uh, and what it, uh, what it implies is, explain it this way, is let's say this is the, the start of the, the master plan. Uh, if nothing happens in that area, then the, uh, the income that the city you see from local property taxes will remain the same or will even uh, decrease. If those, develop those developments will be implemented, then the property, the income from property taxes will, will increase. So what they offer to private developers is that, okay, if you're willing to uh, develop that plan according to our conditions, then we will capitalize all the future, let's say for the next 20 or 25 years, all the future income from property taxes, uh, they uh, will implement a bond for that, for the, uh, uh, similar to the, the value of the, uh, the future uh, income from property taxes, um, and, for the, and that with that bond they will, they will subsidize the private developer who is willing to implement that plan with affordable housing. Um, of course that's very risky because you never know if the development will take place and if those property taxes will really increase as you expect. So the negotiation is in that case is then between the municipality and the private developer because the municipality will implement the bond but will negotiate with the private developer that uh, the private developer should take the risk of uh, not being able to uh, uh, to pay the, the debts of that of that bond, and it depends on uh, well the position of municipality and private developer, uh, or they might, might share the risks or whatever. That that's always negotiated. So again, if there's no money in development anymore, then 
uh, and it's, it's discussed in the Netherlands, and I, I, I wonder if it's an issue here in, in Brazil. Uh, then go and look to the uh, future, future owners. Uh, then the third model uh, is urban land adjustment, which is we, we very briefly discussed this. Uh, it's different from, from, from public land development, as I just explained, uh, and this is the, the, the model that that is in, for instance. Uh, in Spain, the, the Valencia model, perhaps you, you heard about that, is a, a type of urban land readjustment. In Japan, they make use of that instrument. Uh, in Germany, again. Um, and, well, this is a business case that was, uh, that I discussed a couple of months ago with the city of Amsterdam. The city of Amsterdam gave me this, this business case and asked me, uh, would urban land readjustments help us to solve the problem? The problem is as follows. Uh, it's a small, existing, but very depressed office location with six different owners. Four of the offices are completely let, uh, but uh, investments, renovation investments are needed uh, to, to guarantee future use. Two offices are vacant, uh, and Demolishment and redevelopment for those two offices is uh, inevitable. All owners, all six owners, face the valuation of their properties. And all six owners will also benefit from redevelopment. But the situation is that if the municipality doesn't take any action, then nothing will happen in that area. Because the six owners do not agree with each other on the development. Um, so, how would urban land readjustment work? Um, and I think this instrument is used in, in Brazil as well, in Sao Paulo, isn't it? Uh, no? Okay. Uh, all the owners of land and property transfer their property rights temporarily to uh, an area development company. All land and properties, in this case six properties, are brought in at existing use value. If a minority refuses, uh, they can be obliged to cooperate, but you need le legislation for that. In those countries I mentioned, there is legislation. So if, for instance, if four owners uh, want to uh, participate in this plan, then the other two, the, the remaining two owners, can be forced to participate as well. Uh, the pool of land in that area will be reparceled. Ownership remains with the, the existing, the six existing owners. Uh, and after the completion of the, the, the redevelopment, all the original owners are again assigned property rights. That can be at the same spot, but it can, all, it can also be in other location in that area. Ah. Uh, the property rights that they will receive again uh, will be equal to their original share in, uh, in value or in size. Uh, so if they uh, would, in the, in the beginning, if they would have, let's say, 20% uh, of the, the value in that area would be uh, for one owner, then in a new situation, he will receive again 20% of the property rights in that, in that area. Uh, municipality uh, might uh, decide to, uh, to take ownership uh, of the land for public use in that area. And, and all owners, and this is important, all owners contribute to the costs of redevelopment, uh, but they also benefit equally from value increase. Which means, uh, in, in this business case again, all owners share uh, both costs and value increase, uh, the share of the individual owners in the cost of the re redevelopment depends on the difference between the value after redevelopment and the original value of the properties. Well, for instance, if we have the owners of the, the properties that will be demolished, that present use of that, those properties, vacant properties, will be very low, and 
the, the value of the new properties will be, will be like this. So this is their, uh, their gain. If you look at the owners of the properties that were still in use but will be renovated, then they are at the current use value is like this, uh, and the new use value will be a little bit higher, but not as not a difference as, as large as, as the other owners. So their gain is smaller. It means that the owners of the vacant the, 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 the vacant properties they have to contribute, they will contribute more to the development because they benefit more from the, from the redevelopment than the owners of the, uh, the offices that, uh, that were still used. Well, that, I think that, that might work in certain situations, again, as the other strategies might also work in certain situations. To, uh, to come to a conclusion, um, uh, I think, again, from a pragmatic instrumentalist uh, uh, perspective, that for every development, you know, cities all over the world, uh, it, it makes sense to look at what, what can be the right strategy, depending on ownership situation, depending on what are your objectives, etc. What might be the, the right strategy, the best strategy to implement for that certain location. Uh, and I think uh, choosing the right development model depends on, uh, on what are your planning goals uh, that you want to achieve, what are your social goals that you want to achieve, what are your financial goals that you want to uh, achieve, and perhaps also what, what are your goals related to, to market transparency that you want to achieve. So, for instance, if you look at uh, planning goals and you compare public land development with the other two, then from a government pers perspective, public land development can be attractive because uh, it enables proactive planning. If, as, as a local government, you want to implement a certain plan, uh, if you, for the other two models, you have to wait for, for private initiatives, you have to wait for owner, uh, owner initiatives, for that development take pla takes place. If you have a public land development, then you might, uh, you can start acquiring the land, uh, make the land available, etc. So it's, it's a way of proactive planning, which can be attractive in certain situations. Um, it's also possible to make combinations in one certain area uh, that, for instance, to, to start developments in that area, you might, you might start uh, with a part of that location uh, with a public land development strategy um, and then hope to attract further uh, private developers and then leave it to them to uh, uh, complete the development. If we look at social goals and, and well, let's take social housing or affordable housing, uh, then in every case it's in every model, uh, it will be negotiated. Um, and sometimes, but that depends on, on the legislation, it can be forced. Um, in the public land development model, is negotiated and the building plots are sold. So then there's a very strong position to, for the municipalities, because the municipalities, uh, when they sell building plots, they put in the contract uh, that part of that building, uh, part of that plot, should be used for affordable housing. They might, they might do that. Uh, in the other situations, uh, it can be negotiated, more, for instance, when, when planning permission is, is granted. Uh, you, in, in some countries, it's possible that you will only grant planning permission uh, if the private developer uh, is willing to uh, include affordable housing in, uh, in, in, his, in his plans. When we look at the financial criteria, uh, again, uh, distinguished uh, in, in cost recovery and value capturing, um, then again, it, for all different models, it, it depends on uh, the, the, the legal instruments that, that you might use as, uh, as a municipality. Um, in the public land development, the civil building plots 
uh, guarantees full cost recovery. However, the risk is uh, that plots remain unsold, as I explained. In the other two models, uh, it, it will be again, it, it, it must be negotiated between uh, the, in the first uh, model, between the municipality and the private developer, and in the second model, between the municipality and the landowners. And regarding value capturing, uh, then uh, it's, it's, it's again, it's, it's a bit boring, but it's again uh, the result of negotiations, uh, how it will be divided, as I tried to explain. Uh, if you look at public land development, uh, then it's the planning game shared by the municipality, the land owners, and the private developer. Uh, if it's in the other initiative, uh, the municipality does not share in the, has no position to share in the, uh, uh, the planning game that, that will, uh, will be available for the plan. So they may need other instruments like uh, local property taxes, uh, which might help to uh, capture the value as well. Well, I think I skipped this one. Um, yeah, because it's it more, more or less discussed all of it. Um, and, well, I've come to a, a real completion. This, this is the final slide. Uh, so, what is the best model? I don't know. It depends very much on the local situation. Uh, it, it's also an issue uh, of plot dependency. Historical uh, relations between municipalities and, and private developers. Um, and there are different the pros and cons, I think, for all the three different models. Uh, and again, that's my message. I think it, 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 it's worthwhile to, uh, when you start new developments, always to look at those different uh, models. Uh, that can be used and, and, and then discuss what will be the best model. If you want a paper, then write me an email uh, and uh, there's more information.